Are you a slave to technology? In October last year, the number of smartphones in use worldwide topped 1 billion. When we shop for new shiny things like Apple iPhones, what are our priorities? Is it nice to look at? Do I want what it does? Can I afford it? Do other people say it's reliable? Will it make me feel good to own it? You may think there are other questions, but watch an advert or two and you'll see what the people who sell you that stuff think your priorities are. We're only human and our basic desires change little, unless we force them to. Before high technology came our way, we had other desires to be fulfilled. In medieval England, the only apples were the ones that grew on trees, and they were only available in season. So the lower classes still looked forward to the release of the new season's apple with as much delight as the techno heads do today. Way back when the lives of many an Englishman would be difficult for us to differentiate from slavery, a pound of sugar would cost two days' wages, so fruit and honey had to satisfy the sweet tooth. And it was in no small part our ancestors' sweet tooth and demand for cheaper sugar which empowered the African slave trade. 70% of the Africans enslaved and sent across the Atlantic were employed in the production of sugar. 11 million Africans were enslaved, with 10 million dying in Africa during centuries of warfare and slave raiding parties to satisfy the slave trade. 8 million of those dead or enslaved came from the Congo. The end of the Atlantic slave trade in the second half of the 19th century was not the end of the Congo's woes. To the European colonial powers, Congo was a resource and treated as such. The Europeans carved up Africa systematically, one infamous example being King Leopold II of Belgium. Leopold wanted to have an empire fit for a European monarch. He first tried to get the Philippines from Spain but failed. He then turned his gaze to Africa and hired Stanley, part of the Livingstone Stanley Double Act, to establish a colony in the Congo. Under the guise of a philanthropic and scientific program, Leopold laid private claim to the Congo. This was the middle of a European land rush over Africa, which caused much conflict and culminated in the Berlin Conference. Between November 1884 and February 1885, 14 European powers, plus the USA, haggled over claims and counterclaims in Africa and carved up the country as they desired. You will note that no Africans were present at the discussions. Leopold did very well out of it, obtaining recognition of sovereignty over much of his claims. His new Congo Free state had an area 75 times larger than the country he ruled as a constitutional monarch. And in the Congo, he was an absolute monarch. And he set to work milking his new private cash cow. Initially, his output was ivory, but returns were not what he'd hoped for. And with rubber being the new big thing, he turned to that. This saw forced labor and enslavement of the locals by Leopold's brutal private police force. If quotas were not met, hands were cut off, people tortured and killed. By 1908, 10 million people, half the population of the Congo, were dead. Finally, extreme pressure was applied across the Western world. In the early 1900s, the European and American press began exposing the conditions in the Congo. Mark Twain, Arthur Conan Doyle and others wrote scathing attacks against Leopold, and he was finally forced by the Belgian Parliament to cede control of his private empire to the country of Belgium. Things improved little in the Congo. There was less brutality but forced labour did not cease and nor did the pressure to extract Congo's mineral wealth for the benefit of foreigners. Congo's uranium was stripped to fuel the Manhattan Project and bomb Japan. The Congolese finally achieved independence of a sort in 1960, but the new government was immediately undermined by the CIA as part of US Cold War strategy. Five years of unrest ended with a US-backed coup putting Mobutu in charge of the Congo, which he renamed Zaire. Mobutu raped Zaire for personal gain, whilst the Western world sat back and smiled. The USA and later the Chinese supported Mobutu. They both wanted a defence against the Soviet threat, and everyone ignored Mobutu's human rights record so long as he remained anti-Soviet. At the end of the Cold War, the US lost interest in supporting Mobutu. Zaire finally collapsed when the Rwandan War spilled across the border. 1996 saw the start of the First Congo War, which flowed into the Second Congo War, which ended, allegedly, in 2003. The Congo Wars resulted in millions of deaths and were financed by the sale of the country's mineral assets, often dug out of the ground by hand by children at gunpoint. 
The fighting continues to this day. The dying continues. The mining continues. The forced labour continues. The total mineral wealth of the Congo is estimated to be over $24 trillion. It's estimated to hold 30% of the world's diamond reserves, 80% of the world's cobalt, and 70% of the world's coltan. Coltan derivatives are used in every electronic device you own, and cobalt is in the battery that powers those devices. A mineral wealth of tens of trillions of dollars and a country full of human beings who've seen little beyond slavery, suffering, strife and short lives for 500 years, whilst other countries and other people get rich from their labours. These are simple human beings, no different than you or me, but without the choices we take for granted. With 24-hour, 300 160 degree internet we should all know it's happening by now are we any more civilized than our ancestors do any of us care that our new iphone is made from the systematic slavery and suffering of 21st century congolese children any more than our ancestors cared that their sugary sweets came from the systematic slavery and suffering of 18th century congolese children could we care more should we care more is there an app for that Thanks for watching.